Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 122, July 17th to July 23rd, 1863. Last week, we finally tied up a couple of long campaigns. Lee has retreated back into Virginia, but we will still see some continued campaigning that gets overshadowed following the large battle. We also had the key surrenders of Port Hudson and Vicksburg. We will talk next week about some of the direct aftermath of those capitulations. This week, we are going to look beyond Pennsylvania and Mississippi, checking in on several places. We will head to Arkansas for the Battle of Helena, actually waged on the 4th. Closing out today, we have a very famous event in the assault on Fort Wagner, just outside Charleston. The actions of the 54th Massachusetts tied in with Milliken's Bend and Port Hudson, we've already talked about as being important for future recruitment and usage of black troops. Before we get into that, though, we have had another couple of events that are important for their usage of the Indian Home Guard regiments, as well as also the advancement of colored regiments. We need to go to Oklahoma for Cabin Creek and Honey Spring. Before we do that, though, we do need to talk a little bit about Patreon content. Of course, we have the movie review for Gettysburg posted, and that goes very well with our episodes from the beginning of the month here, of course. And we're going through a string of movies probably here. We got to do uh, Glory, also another classic Civil War movie. So we got to talk about that, especially in connection with Fort Wagner. That's probably going to be next month's Patreon episode. Might release that a little bit early, but then we were going to have to have a quick turnaround and we're probably going to do Ride with the Devil, and that's going to be in connection with Lawrence, Kansas, which is right around the corner here as well. So we got a little string of pretty heavy hitters in terms of movies. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, kind of going through a synopsis and having thoughts on the historical accuracy of the movies, then we do have a link to the Patreon in the show description. And of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. The actions at Cabin Creek and Honey Spring are directly related to one another, so it makes sense to do them both here in this episode. Now, in 1862, Union forces had moved down from Fort Scott in Kansas and occupied Fort Gibson, which is present-day Muskogee, Oklahoma, a little southeast from Tulsa. Fort Gibson is along the Arkansas River and would threaten Fort Smith. As you can imagine, this was not a good thing for the Confederate forces in the region. In order to keep Fort Gibson properly provisioned, however, the Union forces would need to utilize the Texas Road, which connected Kansas to Oklahoma, and then, as you guessed it, Texas. Any cutoff from supply from Fort Scott would prove to be a disaster. Confederates had started to form up around Honey Springs, which was a little south and west of Gibson, for the purpose of potentially assaulting or raiding the enemy. Stan Wati decided in early July to make a go for a large wagon train of supplies coming down at a place called Cabin Creek. Now, Cabin Creek is in the northwest portion of the state and would prove to be a fairly good spot to set up a potential ambush, as there's going to be a second ambush, a second Cabin Creek in 1864. His troops would dig in on the far side of the creek and wait for the supply column commanded by Colonel James Williams, who is the officer of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, also on column along with the 3rd Indian and several other cavalry regiments. This would actually include several companies of the 2nd Colorado, which served, if you recall, at Valverde with their commander, Theodore Dodd. It is not long after these engagements that Dodd and his Colorado infantry would be converted to cavalry and sent to help in anti-guerrilla activity in Missouri. Williams would receive word from Confederate prisoners and deserters that there was going to be an ambush attempt at Cabin Creek. His forces would deploy and for a time skirmish with Wati's entrenched forces. Artillery fire combined with a cavalry charge would drive the rebels from the field. Casualties were reported at 65 killed for the Confederates, and maybe around 50 total casualties 
for the supply column. When we mention the importance of the deserters warning Williams, I think it's important to have sort of the comparison to maybe World War I operations in Africa, where there's a lot of shifting sides, especially among native troops. And it's obviously you're going to have these intelligence issues. If, if folks are changing sides pretty frequently, then it's going to be a problem. So that's why even though Cabin Creek is a great spot for an ambush, and the 1864 raid we'll talk about was more successful. It's going to be also difficult to actually spring an ambush if you have some squeaky wheels there. Despite William successfully getting to Fort Gibson, it was planned by the remaining Confederates to strike at the fort. Douglas Cooper was gathering the necessary troops for such a feat. Three Texas Cavalry Regiments would combine with the 1st and 2nd Cherokee, 1st and 2nd Creek, and 1st Chickasaw Choctaw. William Cabell would be on his way with an additional 3,000 men from Fort Smith. This would give Cooper a heavy numerical advantage when compared to the 3,000 defenders at Gibson. Arriving to take command of the fort would be James Blunt. Now Blunt would receive intelligence that Cabell was on his way, which would be an issue. We are already aware of Blunt's aggressive nature, so it would not be a surprise that he is going to move out against the Confederates at Honey Springs with two brigades, all mixed of Indian Home Guards, Wisconsin and Kansas Cavalry, and the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, as well as Dodd's Coloradians. In addition, he would have several Napoleons and was armed with the fresh supplies that had made it from Fort Scott. His men would move across the Arkansas on flatboats on the 16th. On the 17th, he would run into Cooper's gathered troops. Cooper would be without Stan Wati for this battle, as he had given him an assignment to move out in a diversion. He still held a slight numerical advantage, although his armament was poor. Powder had been compromised due to heavy rains, and the firepower he could bring in artillery was not equivalent to the several Napoleons Blunt possessed. That being said, his mountain howitzers would begin the battle with an artillery duel as both sides deployed. Cooper had deployed in brushy terrain for cover just across Elk Creek. Both sides would knock out a gun from the other, leading to an inconclusive duel. The rebels reportedly did have a longer range experimental gun, which they used during the battle. Blunt would move his line forward to engage the enemy his firepower being greater, although there was also some hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the brush. At a crucial point in the battle, the 2nd Indian Home Guard would move in front of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. Seeing this mistake, the Federal officers would order the 2nd Indian Home Guard to move back. Confederates would believe that this was a general retreat, an attack, but the 1st Kansas would deliver some powerful volleys to the attackers. Seeing that Blunt was attempting to turn his flank, Cooper would make the decision to retreat, his men making their way back across Elk Creek. Texan regiments would sustain casualties in holding the ground. Additional troops would fight a rearguard action to secure the withdrawal. The battle would conclude with 181 Confederate casualties compared to 77 on the Union side. Honey Springs had to be abandoned with supplies burned or captured by the Federals. Cooper would blame the inferior supplies and the fact that Cabell was not present, his reinforcements arriving shortly afterwards. Now, this battle was significant for many reasons. It would be the largest battle fought in the Indian Territory, and also really the last major concentration of rebel strength in the region. For the part of the Union, it would secure Fort Gibson and subsequently the capture of Fort Smith. And it was the first time that black troops would fight in a line of battle, with white troops being significantly engaged. Interesting, too, is the fact that the battle had contained a majority Native Americans, as opposed to white troops. We talked a while back about the three-cornered war, I guess you could say, so there is very much an interesting mix 
of troop dispositions in this battle. And it's probably something that a lot of folks hadn't really thought about, just how diverse the, the war is in this particular region. On July 4th, we have an engagement at Helena, Arkansas. Amazingly, this is going to be the major attempt by Theophilus Holmes, not only to take the river town, but also to relieve the pressure building up on Vicksburg. Unfortunately, it's going to be too late as the attack will occur the same day as the surrender by Pemberton. Holmes would meet with Sterling Price and John Marmaduke on June 18th. He would combine their forces as well as a brigade under John Fagan, arriving from Little Rock, and hopefully would assault Helena. Holmes had been reluctant to pull off a major move like this because he feared failure. We mentioned how in this particular region there's not a whole lot of cooperation between the different regional commanders, different department commanders. Holmes is definitely going to fall into the category not only of being cautious, even with a potentially good target like Helena, but he's also going to not necessarily play well with others. And you could say it's also an administrative failure on the part of the Confederacy to really be able to have a system where these are cooperating, acting in concert, but Holmes is not going to do anyone any favors. You remember all the way back in Prairie Grove how he doesn't want Thomas Hyman to really take the offensive. There is some hesitation there. It might have been better for Hyman if he had taken the advantage while he could. That would have probably been better for the Confederacy in terms of an offensive. And so we see this kind of cautious behavior rearing its head once again, even in a dire situation where Vicksburg needs to be relieved. There needs to be some kind of a release of pressure. Now, Samuel Curtis had taken the city in 1862, and not only was it a supply station along the Mississippi, but could also be used as a jump-off point to move further into Arkansas, threatening Little Rock, which is exactly what's going to happen. So there is a self-preservation element to be had from Holmes and his department. All in all, they could put together some 7,500 men to face off against 4,100 defenders commanded by Benjamin Prentice but also mostly led in the field by Frederick Salmon. Prentice would draw on his Shiloh experience. If you recall, he was one of the major figures of the battle. There were rumors of a Confederate attack, so they would be ready. As far as defense, a work had been constructed named Fort Curtis, but Crowley Ridge outside of town commanded the positions. Batteries A through D would be constructed on this high ground. C and D to the south on Graveyard Hill, and Hindman Hill protecting the western and southern approach. Hindman Hill was named as such because this is where Thomas Hindman lived. A and B would be further to the north, with A being on Ryder Hill. Additional support could be provided by the Navy, as has been the course of action for many of these engagements along the river. Fourth of July festivities were canceled because of the rebel threat, which could have been a disaster. But disaster would partly be avoided because of the weather. Rains had made several of the roads turn into mud, making the movement to Helena a tiring process for almost all the rebels, except Fagan's brigade, which traveled mostly via steamboat. Holmes would be concerned about the success of the operation on arrival. They no longer held the advantage of surprise, and the defenses were formidable. The key to the defense around Helena, though, was the high ground, which, if taken, could be used to render the defense. So with that being the primary objective, and of course the numerical advantage being held, the attack would go forward as planned. Early in the morning on the 4th, Colonel William Brooks would lead a contingent from his 34th Arkansas in a probe to the south. There, they would run into Union pickets, opening the battle. In the north, John Marmaduke would dismount his troopers with the objective of taking Ryder's Hill. With that high ground secured, rebel artillery could neutralize Battery B. His flank was to be protected by Lucius Marsh Walker and his cavalry, 
Walker would run into heavier resistance than was expected, though, in the form of the 5th Kansas and 1st Indiana Cavalry, so he would not be able to support Shelby and Colton Green, whose brigades ran into the 29th Iowa. Facing this stiff resistance without support, the cavalry under Marmaduke would not be able to accomplish their objective in taking the hill. Marmaduke would be angry with Walker because he was under the impression he only saw light resistance. This anger would not only lead to Marmaduke intentionally not informing Walker of the retreat at the conclusion of the battle, but it would also lead to a duel between the two officers in September, mortally wounding Walker. There definitely should have been some HR mediation there, but perhaps they did not have HR on hand. Meanwhile, Fagan's brigade would begin their attacks on Hindman Hill and Battery D. They would see some success in pushing back the Union forces, but they were also advancing unsupported. The rough terrain would lead Price to be bogged down, so he would not step off until later. The Union troops had felled trees and constructed Abatee to great effect. In addition, their artillery was able to sweep the avenues of approach, inflicting heavy casualties on the rebels. When Price does begin his portion of the attack, he would see some success from his two brigades under McRae and Parsons. They would be able to take Battery C on Graveyard Hill. Price would pause, though, his artillery being unable to traverse the difficult ground. Some crews had been able to move forward with the infantry to work the captured northern guns, but the Federals had done a good job in spiking any artillery they did not remove. Holmes would actually then order forward the 7th Missouri to take Fort Curtis beyond. With Fagan stalled, the Union troops were able to reform and counterattack after pouring in artillery fire in the lone Missouri regiment. Holmes and Price would realize that further attacks would come to little and order a retreat. The assault had accumulated 1,600 casualties compared to around 220 federal losses. A large portion of these 1,600 rebels would be prisoners taken by the federal counterattacks. The 2nd Arkansas United States Colored Troops would protect the Union flank, and while not directly engaged, it would still be the first time a black regiment sees action in Arkansas. With the attempt failed, this would mark really the last offensive action by the Confederates in the state. From July 10th to July 18th, we have action at Charleston. Now, we really have not been in the area since the failed naval assault back in April. There would be a new crack at the birthplace of the rebellion. Rear Admiral John Dahlgren would combine with General Quincy Gilmore. Now, Dahlgren had held an administrative role with the Navy, but wanted to be involved in the field. You may have heard in the course of the narrative here, we're talking about Dahlgren guns. Well, there you go. Gilmore, you remember, was behind the successful siege of Fort Pulaski back in 1862. In 1863, he would be commanding the 10th Corps, or the Department of the South, and use those troops for the intended operations. Alfred Terry and Truman Seymour would both command divisions. The plan was going to be simple. If you recall the defense of Charleston, in the southern portion we have James Island, which is where we fought the Battle of Secessionville. Morris Island is off of James Island right along the coast. Two forts on this island, Fort Wagner, which is relatively in the center, and Fort Gregg on a spit to the north and the mouth of the harbor protected this area. With naval support, Gilmore would advance his forces from nearby Folly Island, landing on the southern portion of Morris Island, capture Wagner and Gregg, and then neutralize Fort Sumter with rifled artillery. Obviously, he is taking his previous experience and wanting to put it to use. As you remember, Fort Sumter is of the same ilk as Fort Pulaski. So it is very logical to assume that rifled artillery could, at a closer range, render the fort. Wagner, though, is going to be a sand, earthen fort, protected by a moat and palmetto trunk abatee. What is worse for a potential attacking column is that the sea would protect one side while a creek would protect the other, making for an avenue of assault 
that was really only suitable for one regiment at a time. On the Confederate side, while PGT Beauregard was commanding the department, Roswell Ripley was the district commander. Colonel Robert Graham would be the commander of the Morris Island defenses for the beginning of the action, but that would move on to William Tolliver, a more experienced and ranking officer. Battery Wagner, or Fort Wagner, would have some 1,800 defenders from South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina, although it would be mostly men from North Carolina on the 18th. The work would be armed fairly well in terms of artillery, with two 32-pound carronades, two 8-inch shell guns, two 32-pound howitzers, a 42-pound carronade, and an 8-inch seacoast mortar. Because of their approach in the narrow land space and over open ground, it was not going to be easy, even with numerical superiority. Gilmore decided that he needed to conduct some feints to keep reinforcements from getting to Fort Wagner. He would have faint movements on James Island, which would include a move up the Stona River and landing of Alfred Terry's division. Terry's troops would be attacked by Confederates at their camp at Grimble's Landing on the 16th. We have an account of the battle. We are on the march to Fort Wagner to storm it. We have just completed our successful retreat from James Island. We fought a desperate battle there Thursday morning. Three companies of us, B, H, and K, were out on picket about a good mile in advance of the regiment. We were attacked early in the morning. Our company was in the reserve when the outposts were attacked by rebel infantry and cavalry. I was sent out by our captain in command of a squad of men to support the left flank. The bullets fairly rained around us. When I got there, the poor fellows were falling down around me with pitiful groans. Our pickets only numbered about 250 men, attacked by some 900. It is supposed by the line of battle in the distance that they were supported by the reserve of some 3,000 men. We had to fire and retreat toward our own encampment. One poor sergeant of ours was shot down alongside of me. Several others were wounded near me. God has protected me through this, my first fiery leaden trial, and I do give him the glory and render my praises unto his holy name. My poor friend, Sergeant Peter Volgesang, is shot through his lungs. His case is critical, but the doctor says he may probably live. His company suffered very much. Poor good and brave Sergeant Joseph Wilson of his company H, after killing four rebels with his bayonet, was shot through the head by the fifth one. Poor fellow. May his noble spirit rest in peace. The general has complimented the colonel on the gallantry and bravery of his regiment. The battle was significant because it does include the first combat experience for the 54th Massachusetts, a regiment commanded by Robert Gold Shaw, comprising black troops. These would actually include some pretty impressive names. For instance, Frederick Douglass' son Lewis was a color sergeant in the regiment. Because this is one of the first black regiments for the Union, there are many recruits not from the state of Massachusetts, but soldiers comprising from all over the North. The 54th would go to the aid of the 10th Connecticut, which was in danger of being cut off by the attacking rebels. There would be 14 killed and 17 wounded, compared to 3 killed and 12 wounded for the Confederates. Terry would withdraw, moving his men to join forces already on Morris Island. Speaking of that though, just to rewind, on July 10th, Dahlgren would begin bombarding the Confederate works. In the evening, George Strong's brigade would make a successful amphibious landing, getting a foothold on the island. They would be able to capture several batteries on their move further north. July 11th would see the initial assault by Strong's brigade, but it would be unsuccessful and bloodily repulsed. The 7th Connecticut would see some success, but would be driven back by small arms fire and artillery. The move inflicted 339 casualties for Strong's brigade. It would be apparent there would need to be more men thrown forward if the landward side was to be taken. July 18th would be the next attempt at Fort Wagner. With all the assembled troops at the disposal for the Union, they would plan their next assault. The 54th Massachusetts would lead the attack, attached to Strong's Brigade. The 6th Connecticut, 54th New York, 3rd New Hampshire, 76th Pennsylvania, also known as the Keystone Zwaves, and 9th Maine would also be involved in the attack. 
Colonel Haldeman Putnam would follow up strong with a brigade of his own, which included the 7th New Hampshire, 62nd and 67th Ohio, as well as the 100th New York. Now, Strong is actually going to be the one who asks the 54th if the color bearer falls, who will pick them up? And it is Shaw who responds definitively, I will. Which, if you watch Glory, you know that scene, and rest assured, we're going to review that as mentioned at the top of the episode, but it's probably one of the more famous lines. Land batteries would support the attack, and the U.S. Navy would pound Wagner for 11 hours prior to the infantry jump off. In fact, there is so much artillery fire incoming that some of the defenders refused to man the lines. Shaw would lead the 54th forward in the evening. We have a first-hand account of the attack from a Captain Appleton of the 54th. The fire became terrible. Shell, canister, and musket balls tore through us. The terrible roar deafened us as we pressed on. At last, we reached the moat of the fort. The sky had become black with clouds, and the thunder cracked and lightning flashed. As we reached the ditch, someone gave an order by the right flank, and Company B on my right apparently filed off that way. My company preserved its alignment, and the two cannonades in the bastions on that instance were fired, the one on the right tearing the right of the company to precise, killing Sergeant Andrew Benton, and others, and about at the same instant a like disaster fell upon the left of the company from the bastion on our left. I could hear the rattle of the balls on the men in the arms. I was in front of the company and leaped down into the water, followed by all the men left standing. On my left, the colonel with the colors and the men of the companies on the left waded across their breast with me. We reached the base of the curtain and climbed up the parapet, our second battalion right with us. On the top of the works, we met the rebels, and by the flashes of their guns, we looked down into the fort. Apparently a sea of bayonets some eight or ten feet below us. The colonel planted the colors on the traverse, next the service magazine on the left of the curtain, and the fighting was now about them. In my immediate front, the enemy were very brave and met us eagerly. Bayonets, musket butts, revolvers, and swords, and musket shots were all used, but our small number and our disadvantage in being up against the sky told heavily. The men rapidly turning out around me. I received a sword thrust through my blast, but it fortunately passed between my legs. About this time, I saw our colors fall, rise again, and go back through the water of the ditch borne by someone. Finding it impossible to hold the crest of the parapet, we were so near the enemy as to be able almost to touch them, and they were able to use cannon rammers and hand spikes in the melee. We withdrew our diminished numbers to the outer slope of the parapet, hoping to hold in until our second brigade came up and continued the fight as best we could. On the left bastion, the enemy rallied and opened an inflating fire with muskets upon us. Not one man stood on the parapet when I left. All down the exterior slope, as well as on the top, lay the bodies of our men, and behind us in the water of the moat, the poor fellows' bodies lay like stepping stones. If we cannot take the fort unaided, our duty is to hold what little we have gained until the attack of the brigade behind us, and to keep if possible the enemy from firing their cannon upon our advancing troops. To that task we've been our energies. Captains Pope and Jones and Lieutenant Emerson, who had just been assigned to my company and myself a crowd of our men, of all companies, perhaps 50 in number, now commenced firing at every rebel who showed himself. We picked up the muskets of the fallen, but found many ineffective from being filled with sand. The coolness and bravery of these officers and men was very marked. So the 54th leading the way would veer to the left once they cleared the open ground, attacking the relative center of the fort. The 6th Connecticut and 48th New York would come in behind the 54th, attacking to their right. The position they were attacking was the curtain wall, which is essentially like a little indent in the wall that provides inflating fire from the angles where it juts inward. Putnam's brigade would then follow up on the seaward defenses. Unfortunately for the attackers, the 54th, 6th, and 58th were the only regiments who were able to reach the parapets. As described, there was heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting, especially amongst the 54th. Strong's regiments would not be able to advance because of the heavy canister fire. Putnam's brigade would likewise only see a portion of the two Ohio regiments reach the work. 
the 32nd Georgia would arrive and push out the attackers. The 54th would stay as long as they could, providing covering fire for the retreating Yankees. Shaw had been killed, as had Colonel Lyman Chatfield of the 6th Connecticut. Strong would be mortally wounded by a grape shot round in the thigh, and Putnam had likewise been killed, ordering the withdrawal. Overall, it was a bloody attempt by the 10th Corps, resulting in 1,500 casualties as opposed to 174 from the southern side. Sergeant William Harvey Kearney of the 54th would receive the Medal of Honor for saving the colors. His regiment had paid a high price, suffering some 40% casualties. Lewis Douglas would write about how his proud regiment was now torn to pieces. This would conclude the ground attempts on Fort Wagner. In September of 1863, the work would be abandoned, followed 160 days of shelling, but Charleston is not going to fall until 1865. Rest assured, we'll get there soon enough. Let's go ahead and pause right there. This week was pretty eventful. We had the Battle of Helena in Arkansas. That is a failed attempt, and also a late attempt to try to relieve Vicksburg by Theophilus Holmes. We had the Battle of Honey Springs, as well as Cabin Creek in Oklahoma, that show a very diverse flavor to the war in Oklahoma. Finally, we had some continued assaults on Charleston, as there's still going to be an emphasis to try to take that city. The 54th Massachusetts have assaulted Fort Wagner in their famous charge that resulted in heavy casualties, including the loss of their colonel, Robert Gold Shaw. Next week, we're going to jump around some more. We have the immediate aftermath of the Vicksburg siege, as well as some action in Louisiana. And of course, we need to talk about John Hunt Morgan's raid into Indiana and Ohio. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.